this scripture to you. It says in Psalm 62, David writes this. He says, my soul find rest in God alone. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. Say that last part with me. So I will not be shaken. So things around you might be shaking, but you don't have to be shaken by them. Your confidence, your hope is found in Jesus. It's found in God. And so we have a hope that it goes beyond anything else we can compare it to. I wanna pray for us, God. I pray that we would be reminded of the peace and the hope that we have because of Jesus. And I pray your peace over every person here today and everybody joining online today. God, I pray that they would know you in a real way, know your power and know your presence in a real way. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody together said, amen. 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 Church, you can be seated. So glad you're with us here at the Gardens location. And a big shout out to everybody joining us at Church Online. Good to have you with us. And uh, a special greeting to all the men and women in the armed forces joining us around the world right now today. We love you so much. Yeah, so as we were preparing for Dorian to come through our region, we knew that that we would not be able to gather together like we normally do on the weekend. And so we just want to give a shout out to everyone that's joining us wherever you're joining us from. As we gather this weekend, we're able to have services um, over the weekend, but not on Sunday. So we're missing everybody so much and we love you so much. And we just want you to know that we're praying for you and for your families for peace and protection in the next couple of days. Amen. And we're praying for Dorian to die, right? Hashtag death to Dorian. I think our prayers are being answered. Yes, Yes. in Jesus' name, just let her go out into the middle of the ocean and die. That's what we've been praying. All right now, if your name is Dorian, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that personally to anybody there. Hey, but we are glad you're with us today. And uh, we have been preparing. Uh, our teams have already been out working and serving in the community. Thank you for being a part of that. You didn't even know you were part of that, but uh, we're partnering with uh, organizations have been connecting with us, Convoy of Hope and Samaritans First, so that we as a church can be the first responders for their organization. Uh, if the storm decides to hit somewhere along the eastern coast here of the United States, I want you to know we're ready to go. We're set as a team to go. So thank you for being a part of that. You know what's so great is that church, you are such a generous church. And because of your generosity in, um, in, in, the, in this last year, we were actually positioned in a strong position of strength to be able to be ready and prepared to serve in the community. And, and already our teams have been serving um, meals to our first responders and law enforcement at the emergency operating centers. We've been putting up shutters in the community. And that's really because we were ready because of your generosity. And you know, it reminded me of a verse in 2 Corinthians, and it says this in 2 Corinthians 9, 11, that you will be enriched in every way. And enriched just means blessed and resourced so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. See, generosity is so life-giving. Generosity is what can bring hope to hopelessness. And generosity actually has been breathing life into our community. It helps us to know what, it helps us to have everything we need to do, everything we need to do what we need to do, right? That's right, and we got a lot to do. We got a lot to do. There's a lot God wants us to be. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your faithfulness and being a part of everything that God is up to around here. I wanna ask the ushers to come and wait upon us. We're gonna go ahead and give our offering today. And we have a lot to be grateful for. Uh, A time of uh, giving offering is a time of giving thanks, a time of worship. And so when you think about how we've been spared, we have a lot to thank God for. And the gifts that we give today are actually gonna help us be the church we're supposed to be tomorrow and next week and into the coming months. So thank you for your faithfulness and giving. If this is your first time at Christ Fellowship, no pressure on you to give anything. This is for the rest of us that understand we have been blessed like Julie just read to be a blessing to other people. You can, uh, if you're joining with us online, I wanna challenge you to get in on this. Uh, You can click the little to give button right there and you can be a part of helping us be the hands and feet of Jesus in our region and around the world. Also for all of us, we have a a new texting to give option. You can just text the word give to 441-441 and you'll fill out the form one time on your phone. It's safe and secure. And then in the future, if you ever want to text to give, it just automatically is set up for you. So I challenge you to be a part of that online. All right, so let's pray together. God, thank you for so much that you've blessed us with. We are truly humbled today. We pray you take these gifts that we give back, these offering that we give and use it uh, to make your love and your message of hope um, known all around this region in South Florida and all over the world as we reach out as a church together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And together, everybody said? Amen.
Amen. Amen. Hey, a couple updates, church. I am so sad because this Wednesday night, we were going to be gathering as a sisterhood, but we're going to have to postpone our sisterhood night. We, our team's going to be working out in the community, and I know many of you will be too, but stay posted on social media. We'll give you some updates in the days to come. And also, um, as you know, this has been a, a year that we have declared for our church that would be a year of freedom. Yeah. And in the coming weeks, we're going to challenge all of our church family, everyone that calls Christ Fellowship their home, to step up and to step into our freedom study. And it's going to be an eight-week study with an encounter, and you're not going to want to miss out. So if you haven't yet signed up, um, you can text 441, the word freedom, to 441-441, or some of our team will be out at kiosk at the end of service today. So we can't wait to see what God's going to do through our time together. Yeah, remember, we are people that love what God does in the moment, but we understand the process and the power of the process. And we're believing this season is going to set us free like never before. Awesome. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, it's time for you to preach. Okay, I love you. I've been kissing that girl since, well, it wasn't seventh grade. She didn't kiss me in seventh grade. It took a few years. Hey, we're so glad you're with us uh, today. And, uh, you know, we had to make the decision a few days ago not to have church on Sunday um, because the report said a few days ago that Sunday was going to be a pretty rough day around here. And we care so much about our dream team and volunteers and your safety that we wanted to make sure uh, that you'd be okay. So, of course, it looks like Sunday's going to be great. But, uh, you know, just because we're not gathering in a church... We can still be the church, right? So I want to challenge all of you on this Sunday when you uh, normally would be in church, go connect with some people that never come to church and go carry church to them and be the church of Jesus Christ this week. Get, get, get a chance to do something you've never done before on a Sunday with my blessing. Skip church and go be the church. All right. Um, this weekend, I decided I wanted to preach about Dorian. Since we're all talking about her, we might as well preach about her. Right? So if you'd open your Bibles to the third book of Dorian, no, she's not in there. In fact, uh, there's nobody who even had the name Dorian in the Bible. But the truth is there are several stories in the Bible about storms, storms that the followers of Jesus had to go through. And what they did and what God did in the middle of the storm made all the difference of how they made it through the storm. And here's one thing I know, we're all going to have storms in our life that we have to face. Storms of hurricane epic proportions. Emotional storms where we find ourselves in relationships that have fallen apart or somebody's betrayed us. It could be financial storms where you don't know how you're gonna make it through. It could be a physical storm. Some need in your body or in your family that physically you just don't know how we're gonna be, make it through. The doctors aren't giving you any uh, hope and you're gonna face a storm in that moment and what you do in that moment will matter. There's two stories of storms that I want to look at today. Both of them are found in the Gospel of Mark. If you have your Bibles, you can open up there. We're going to look at the lessons we can learn from what the followers of Jesus did when they met God in the middle of their storm. The first story is found in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, and it says this. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. So they left the crowd behind, taking him along, got in the boat. There were also other boats with them, and a furious squall came up. A horrible storm came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that they were nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Okay, you got the picture? So he's asleep, bad storm so bad that the disciples think they're gonna die. Water's in the boat. And the disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Then he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? How is it that you still have no faith? That last question has haunted me. When you looked at them and said, how is it that you still have no faith? How is it that you've seen everything that I've done? You've seen firsthand the miracles that I have performed, the, the eyes that were blinded, that were opened, the bodies that were lame, that were healed, the dead raised back to life. How is it that you still have no faith or such little faith? Todd, how is it that I've answered your prayers time and time again? I've come through for you when you didn't know how I would come through for you. And you can look back on those moments and see everything I've done for you, Todd. How how is it that you still have such little faith? That's how I read my Bible. I just make it all personal to me. And then 
The disciples look at each other and they say, who is this in verse 41? That even the wind and the waves obey him. The Bible teaches us that we all go through storms. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. Not maybe, <laughs> not might, no, you will. Just count on it, you will have trouble. Thank you, Todd. You will have trouble, but take heart, be encouraged for I have overcome the world. Now that word trouble in the original language doesn't mean I can't find my keys. Where's my phone? Oh, I can't believe they cut me off in traffic. No, that's not the kind of trouble. They can't find water at the Publix. I mean, that's not the kind of trouble they're talking about here. They're actually talking Jesus. That word means severe persecution. It actually means in the Bible, affliction and distress. Jesus is saying, you're, you're gonna have to weather some storms in life, but you're gonna weather the storm. You're gonna, you're gonna get through it. They're part of life. Don't be overcome by them because I have overcome them already. See, Jesus was reminding us that this world isn't all there is. I've already overcome this world. And he's reminding us that your home isn't in this world. Do you know that you have a home and it's not here? So even if that home had been blown down, this still wasn't your home. You have a home in heaven, right? Now we, we keep thinking that this is our home. We get so comfortable here now. We want everything to be good here now. We expect, man, we get all upset when we face trials and troubles. Man, I can't believe this happened. They left me and they're upset. And this, I can't believe the person said that. And we, we, we can't believe this. We expect things to be perfect here. No sickness. No disease, no sin. Come on, that's heaven, right? We're confused. And in fact, I believe that the trials that we go through in this world, the struggles and the storms actually make us long for that world, for our home. It actually makes us think about heaven where there is no more death and no more sickness and no more cancer and no more divorce and no more disease. It's over. There's only grace and love and hope. And until then, we're longing for that. The Bible even says in Romans chapter eight that the, the earth, the world is groaning and moaning as in childbirth, longing for the return of the Messiah, which is what's causing, I think, a lot of these storms in our world today. There's a longing for the return of God. And by the way, let me just say this. If you're going through a storm, God did not cause your storm. He, he will allow storms to come in our lives, but he doesn't cause the storm. Most of the time, we cause our own storms, right? I mean, if we're just honest, are the choices we make put us in the places we are. The seeds, the seeds that we sowed in the last season are what we're reaping in this season, right? You know what I'm saying? We, we just, the choices we make, we're dealing with the, 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 sometimes we're dealing with the storms that are caused by other people's choices. Remember Jonah? When Jonah was running away from God and he got caught up in that storm, he wasn't the only one caught up in the storm. All the other sailors, all the other passengers, the people that owned the cargo that got thrown overboard, everybody was affected by Jonah's sin. Sometimes we're affected by other people's stupid choices, right? You know who I'm talking about. Hopefully they're not sitting next to you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I can say this, no matter who causes the storm, God will use whatever storm you go through for his good and for his glory if you look to him in the middle of that storm. The disciples were in this storm and they were afraid and they wake Jesus up and Jesus stands up and says, peace be still. And it says instantly the winds and the waves, instantly there was calm. Instantly all was well, just like it was supposed to be. Don't, don't you wish Jesus would just speak to Dorian that way? Peace be still. I was trying that all week long. Peace be still, Dorian. It's kind of working. Get out of here, Dorian. A lot of you have been praying for that. We're going to keep praying. We don't want it to affect anybody anywhere on that coast in Jesus' name. And sometimes God speaks directly to a storm. And it's awesome when God speaks directly to the storm, right? He speaks to the storm of sickness in the body of somebody you love and instantly they are healed, made well. He speaks to the storm of, of lack or need and he brings provision from the most unlikely source. He speaks to a storm of discouragement and he breathes hope on you. Just, I mean, it's, love, it's so great when God speaks directly to the storm, but sometimes he doesn't speak to the storm. Sometimes he just wants to speak to you. See, sometimes God speaks to the storm and sometimes God speaks to us. 
Sometimes God speaks to the storm and sometimes God speaks through the storm. He will actually use the storm to grab our attention. I know that's the way it is in my life. It's usually when I'm walking through the places that are most troubling, most unsettling, most concerning. That's when I'm looking up to God and going, oh, like those disciples, wake up. Don't you care that we're gonna die? In a second story found also in the Gospel of Mark, two chapters later in Mark chapter six, we see another storm. The disciples were in a boat heading across the very same Sea of Galilee, only this time Jesus wasn't with them in the boat. It says that Jesus was up on the mountainside praying. So he's praying up on the mountainside, miles away from the disciples that are in this boat trying to row across to the other side. And this is what it says in Mark 6, verse 48. It says, he, Jesus, saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, which would be about 3 a.m., he went out to them walking on the lake. I want you to hear something today. I want you, Jesus wasn't right there with them in proximity. He wasn't in the boat. He was up on a mountainside, but he saw them. He saw his disciples. He saw what they were going through. He saw the struggle that they were in. And I want you to know something today. He sees you. He sees what you're going through. You aren't forgotten. He hasn't, he hasn't left the building. His eyes are on you. In fact, as I was praying for this service and I was praying for you, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Todd, make sure you tell him that I see him. Make sure you tell him that my eyes are on them and, I, and I've got them in my view and I'm actually praying for them. I'm interceding for them. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus is at the right hand of God right now interceding for you. He's praying for you. How cool is that? You got Jesus on your prayer team. You don't need anybody else. You got Jesus praying for you. That's pretty awesome right there. Not only does he see you, not only is he praying for you, but he's actually coming to you right in the middle of the mess that you find yourself in. He walks to you. And I know we think a lot of times that God is doing his greatest work when everything is great. Oh, it's good. Kids are good. Business is good, money's good, right, I'm feeling good, health is good. We think that's when God is good. No, that's when he's doing his greatest work in my, no, no, no. I believe God does his greatest work when we're in trouble. In fact, I believe that God lives in trouble. How do I know? Psalm 46, glad you asked. It says, God is a very present help. Say it with me, God is a very present help in times of trouble. Well, here's what I know. There's days I'm in trouble and the next day you're in trouble and the next day after that, she's in trouble. God's always living in trouble. He's doing his work in trouble to get you through whatever trouble is troubling you. And he's gonna get you out of where you are into the grace and the strength that he's got for your life. We, we just sang about it. I count the joy come every battle because I know that's where you be. I count the joy come every battle because I know that you're gonna be the other one right there with me in the middle of the fire, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna leave me to be burned up. You're gonna see me through. You're gonna hold back the waters. I count the joy. When I go through a battle, Lord, I'm gonna count it a joy because I know I'm gonna find you there in a way that I had not known you before that battle. I'm gonna find you in the battle. Just remember that the presence of a problem doesn't mean the absence of your God. The presence of your problem, a lot of times we think, where's God? The presence of your problem doesn't mean God is absent. Just because things are hard doesn't mean God is gone. No, he's not like some of your neighbors that took up and left to Georgia during Dorian coming, they're, he's, they're gone. He's not gonna leave you abandoned. He's gonna be right with you in the middle of the storm. He doesn't promise he, he doesn't promise to keep us from our problems. He promises his presence in the middle of our problems to get us through our problems. And so in this story, the disciples are out there rowing in the boat and it says, Jesus comes walking to them. And in verse 49, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear like little girls. <laughs> so here's the disciples out in this boat. Jesus comes walking to them. And it says they did not recognize him. That has always puzzled me. How could you not, you, you, you're with the man 24 hours a day. I mean, you, are, you were just with him a few hours ago. How could you not recognize that it was Jesus? Could it be that in the middle of our storms, we get so focused 
on our problem that we miss the answer to the problem? Could it be that we're so focused on our problem that we miss the provider in the middle of the problem? That, that we're so focused on the dilemma that we're not even aware that deliverance has walked in the room. Listen, don't be so unaware of God. Don't be, sometimes you're so aware of the storm, you're unaware that God is right there with you in the middle of the storm. I would encourage you to look up, look around. I mean, God's, he's coming to you somewhere. Go, quit focusing on the problem and start looking for Jesus. Start expecting him to come walking over the water of that problem in your life. That's faith, man. Jesus is gonna show up. So the disciples freak out. They're terrified. I'd probably freak out too. I'm not picking on them. Verse 50, it says, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, say it with me, don't be afraid. Take courage. It is I, do not be afraid. There it is again, the most common command in all of scripture, take courage, don't be afraid, fear not. Do you know that that is found in the Bible 366 times? There are 366, don't be afraid, verses in the Bible. One for every day and two on a really bad day. You got a second one you can pull from right there. God's, God has you covered. Why? I believe it's the most common scripture because God knows our enemy will try to use fear to rob us of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to walk with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, you'll never experience the life God has created you to live. So Jesus looks at him and says, don't be afraid, take courage, it is I. And in the original language, the it is I is, the same, is translated I am. So literally he would have said, take courage, I am, don't be afraid. I am. The same words that God spoke to Moses out of that burning bush that day on the hillside. I am the great I am. I am the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. I am the God who was. I am the God who is. I am the God who will be. I am the God that is with you now. I am the God that's gonna see you through whatever you're going through. I am here so you don't need to worry. You need to hear that today. God, whatever storm you might be in, and if you're not in a storm today, hang, in, hang on there, you're gonna get there tomorrow, right? You're gonna be in one. Either you're either coming out of one, you're in one, or you're going into one. But I'm here to tell you, you are not going into it alone. God is right there with you. Now this same story is told in the Gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew's Gospel, he, he tells the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is when Peter recognizes it's Jesus and he says, can I come out there with you? Here's what it says in Matthew chapter 14. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come on, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came towards Jesus. What? Yeah, Peter did what nobody else in the history of the world besides Jesus has done. He walked on water. The joker walked on water right there. Can you believe that? He got to, he got to do what Jesus was doing. He, did, he got to do what the other 11 disciples in the boat did not get to do. He walked on water. And as I was thinking about these two stories, I thought sometimes God speaks to the storm, but sometimes God just wants to speak to you. Sometimes he will speak to the storm, peace be still. And then sometimes he wants to speak through the storm. He'll speak to the storm and sometimes he'll speak to us. He spoke to Peter and he, he actually called him out, out of a place of security, out of place of familiarity, out of some relationships that he was familiar with, out of the natural into the supernatural was the call on his life. And I believe that sometimes God will allow storms in our life to either call us up or call us out. The storm will either call us up or call us out. In that first storm, when Jesus at the end said, how is it that you still have no faith? I believe he was calling him up. Come on guys, you gotta have faith. Have some faith in me. You've seen some things that other people haven't seen, so have a little bit of faith. See, there have been many storms that I've had to walk through that God has had to call me up. Come on, Todd, grow up. Come on, Todd, think bigger. People that have hurt me or said something about me or the church or um, situations in uh, my life that have just been uh, tumultuous relationships and God will use that to actually grow me up and call me up. Come on and say, be a man of faith. Trust me in this. Trust me that my grace is gonna be sufficient to carry you through. Trust me that I will provide and make a way where there seems to be no way. Trust me that even though that person left you or that person left you, I will not leave you. I've got you and I'm gonna carry you. Come on. 
Sometimes the storm will call you up, but sometimes the storm is to call you out. See, Peter, in the second storm, Jesus was calling him out of his comfort zone into a faith zone, calling him out of the known into what was completely unknown. And you've heard me say before that whenever God calls you from your known into the unknown, that it's only unknown to you. It's completely known to God. He knows everything about it because he knows everything. So when he calls you out of the known, out of whatever is your security, the things you're finding stability in, the things that you're holding on to, into the unknown, he's waiting for you in the unknown. He's right there. And in the unknown, you will begin to know him in a way that you never have known him before. Because in that moment, you're trusting him. In that moment, you're walking with him. In that moment, you're experiencing the supernatural in your life. In fact, I believe that while God will probably never call you to physically walk on physical water, Jesus will call you out to walk in places where your trust is without borders. No limit. Take me out upon the waters wherever you may lead me. And I believe if you follow him out of your known into the unknown in the middle of that storm, that storm will become the setup for the supernatural. Your storm will get you out of your boat into the supernatural things of God. In fact, without the storm, Peter would have never walked on water. Do you ever think about that? Because without the storm, Jesus wouldn't have come walking to him. Without the storm, he wouldn't have called him out on the, on, the, on the water. The storm was actually a setup for the supernatural. And when I read my Bible, I see that over and over and over. In fact, I started to think, oh my gosh, that's all the way through the Bible. The woman with the issue of blood, that sickness that she had for 12 years that nobody could help, it was just a setup for the supernatural. In Kings, when the widow had, in the book of Kings, the, the widow had uh, just a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. And God took her, she said, I have nothing except this little bit of oil and this little bit of flour. And God took her except and did something exceptional with it. That was just a setup for a miraculous work in her life where the oil and the flour never ran out through the entire famine. It was a setting for the supernatural. So if you're in a storm today, let me tell you, you are in the setting for a supernatural work and move of God. In fact, without the storm, you probably won't see the supernatural. Without the miracle, you won't have a miracle without the mess. You gotta have the mess if you want a miracle, right? And I've said before, the bigger the mess, the bigger the miracle. I mean, God would have never had to close the mouth of the lions if Daniel hadn't been thrown in the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if they hadn't been thrown in the fiery furnace, there wouldn't be another one in the fire. There would another one standing there because it would never happen, right? If Abraham and Sarah hadn't been barren and longed for a child, they wouldn't have needed the supernatural, miraculous provision of, Jake, of, of, of Isaac years and years ago, years later. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have happened. You need, without the storm, you don't experience the supernatural. So if your problem is too big for you, let me remind you, it is the perfect size for God. You might be facing something that's so big and you think it's gonna take you out. No, 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 it's just setting you up. There's a couple by the name of Brian and Andrea and uh, Adrian, Brian and Adrian out at our Royal Palm campus. But years ago, they lived out in the Wellington Western communities and they, um, uh, their life was falling apart about five years ago. Their marriage fell apart. Their family was falling apart. See, they had tried to live without God in their lives and they had tried to live without truth in their marriage and they ended up without hope for their future. Until so one day when they were at the very end, Brian said, well, maybe we ought to go to church and give God a chance. And they walked in the doors of our Royal Palm campus and we just happened <laughs> to be preaching on a relationship series. And we started to, Preach. They said they felt like the whole sermon was just for them. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will do that. And so they decided to keep coming back, keep coming back. They finally got involved in re-engage our marriage ministry. And they got marriage mentors around them that began to help them to deal honestly with their marriage and their situation that was going on. They gave their lives to Jesus. They got involved, went through the journey, got plugged in. He started going to celebrate recovery. And I'm here to tell you, five years later, their marriage is stronger than it had ever been before. They have built their life on Jesus and he's holding everything together. And they've experienced a love and a life like they didn't even know they could have in their home. It wasn't like it just got back to where it was. It got to where it had never been before. 
They, they had a greater revelation of what God wanted to bless in them and do in them because they went through the storm. Their storm became the setup for the supernatural in their lives. And see, I see that in both of these stories in the Gospel of Mark. Both of these stories end with the disciples gaining a greater revelation of who Jesus is. In the first account, when they said, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey his command? They're like, oh, he's the one who made the winds and the, I get it now, creator over everything. And they had a greater revelation of who Jesus was. And then in the second account, they climbed back in the boat. Peter and Jesus climbed back in, in the boat and it says this in verse 32. And when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down and those who were in the boat worshiped him, Jesus saying, truly you are the son of God. Oh, we get it now. Oh, I, I get it. A whole new light. This whole experience, this storm gave them a greater revelation of Jesus. See, their place of desperation became a place of revelation. And I believe for you, your place of desperation can become a place of revelation if you keep your eyes up, if you keep looking for Jesus in the middle of that storm. It's actually setting you up to see and know God like maybe you've never known him before. So a couple things that we must do if we're gonna come out of our storm, whatever storm we're facing, closer to Jesus. Three things we must do. First, you gotta run to God. You gotta run to, we run to our therapist, we run to our friends, we run to our refrigerator. I had Pop-Tarts the other day, getting ready for the storm. We run, we run everywhere, right? How about we run to God? Jesus said in Matthew 11, he said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden and burdened, come to me and I'll give you rest. Let's run to, let's run to God. Some of you need to turn off the Weather Channel, quit watching that, and start turning to God who actually dictates what the Weather Channel actually says. You know what I'm saying? Why don't we turn, why don't we turn to God in prayer? Turn to God in praise. We talked to you last week about turning on praise music in your mind and your heart. Turning on praise music and letting your praise become a problem for your problem. Let worship become the weapon against fear and anxiety in your life. Turn to God. The second place you gotta turn is you gotta turn to God's family. This right here. In these stories, the disciple, disciples were in the boat together. There, there wasn't one disciple out in the boat by himself. You were never created to be a lone follower of Jesus Christ. He made you for a relationship in this family. He actually put his people on your path for a purpose. Did you know that? That purpose is so that when you're down and out and struggling and your faith is low, that somebody around you has enough faith to pick you up. And then the next day when their faith is low, you can pick them up and help them too, right? That's the way God created his family. And I've run into people that I haven't seen around church for a while. I'm like, hey, what's going on? I haven't seen you. He goes, oh, you know, man, things have been so messed up, Todd. My life is, I, I can't come to church right now. My life is such a mess. And I'm like, that's exactly where you need to be. If your life is such a mess, oh no, I, I wouldn't fit in there. I, everybody's got it all together. I'm like, no, nobody's got it all together. There's no perfect people allowed in our church because there's no perfect people. So this is exactly where you need to be. The enemy would try to get you isolated and think you're not worthy and you can't, you don't belong and everything. No, 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 don't you listen to that. You get, you run to God's family, a place where you're gonna be loved and prayed for and prophesied over for the good things God wants to do in your life. Run to God, run to God's family, and you gotta run to God's promises. You gotta run to the promises of God. This book is full of God's promises. So when you're in a storm, you need to go, God, your word tells me you will never leave me nor forsake me. You, your word tells me that you'll never give me more than I can bear. I think you're getting close, but I'm holding on to that promise in Jesus' name. Right? Your word says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort and protect me. And you put a table right out there in front of my enemies and prepare a way for me. Surely goodness and mercy is gonna follow me and my family all the days of my life. I'm gonna hold on to your promises and you speak them back. And I tell you what, when you run to God and you run to God's family and you run to God's promises, you're gonna run through that storm stronger with a vision of God's grace over your life like never before. So I wanna pray for us today. I wanna to pray, I wanna pray for God's peace and protection and his presence, no matter what storm you might be going through today. I'm gonna to pray that you'll do what we just talked about, that you'll run to God this week. 
Get up a little bit early, spend some time with God before you spend time with anybody else. That you'll run to God's family, that you'll build relationships with other followers of Jesus Christ that will help you follow Jesus better. And that you will run to the promises of God and hold on to them. And the second prayer I wanna pray is for the, those of you here today or those of you joining online that, that don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you grew up going to church, but you never grew up in relationship with Jesus. A relationship is the only way that you can have the peace of God. So you've got to have peace with God before you can have the peace of God. And the only way that you make peace with God is through Jesus Christ. And so I want to lead you in a prayer to make sure that's right today. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father God, I want to thank you that your word teaches us how we should go, how we should think, what to do in the middle of life's trials and storms that we all face. And Lord, I pray today that we would do our part, that we'd run to you, we'd run to your family, we'd run to your promises, your word. And then Lord, I pray you would do your part, that you would cover each person with peace, every person with your protection. Give them your presence, no matter what storm they might be walking through today. And as we continue to pray, if you're here today and you would say, Todd, this second prayer is for me because I, I don't know if I have a relationship with Jesus, but I want one, or maybe your relationship just isn't where it needs to be. If you would say, Todd, would you include me in this last prayer right where you are? Would you just lift your hand up in the air and say, yeah, Todd, this is my prayer. Hold it up high. Even if you're joining us at home, I want you to raise your hand up as a testimony that you're saying, yes, I want what Jesus has for me. Okay, we're gonna pray this prayer together. Those of you with your hands up, you pray it a little bit louder than everybody else. Just pray this, say, dear Lord Jesus, Thank you for loving me. Forgive me for all my sins, for going my own way. Today I follow you. I surrender my life to you. Fill me with your peace. Fill me with the presence of the Holy Spirit that I may live the life I've been created to live. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on church, let's thank God for those people today.